Think Like a Man is a romantic comedy based loosely on Steve Harvey's 2009 book of the same title. The description of this self-help book from the back cover is as follows. Steve Harvey can't count the number of impressive women he's met over the years. Women who can run businesses, keep a household with three kids in tip-top shape, and chair a church group all at the same time. So when it comes to relationships, why can't these women figure out what makes men tick? According to Steve, it's because they're asking other women for advice when they should be going directly to the source. In Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, Steve lets women inside the male mindset, introduces concepts such as the 90-day rule, and reveals the five questions women should ask a potential partner to determine how serious he is. Sometimes funny, sometimes direct, but always truthful. Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man is a book you must read if you wanna understand how men think when it comes to relationships, intimacy, and love. This movie follows the lives of four different couples. In this review, we will be breaking down the relationship between Lauren and Dominic, or as the title card says, the dreamer versus the woman who is her own man. And if by dreamer they meant a weak-minded, irresponsible, pathological, lying simp, then yeah, he's a dreamer, all right. It's quite fitting that he matches Lauren, who is not only her own man, but an egotistical, money-hungry, stubborn clout chaser who believes she is a prize because she has a successful career. Because nothing screams sexy more than being the COO of a company. I mean, am I right, fellas? Let me know in the comments if that's on the top of the list when you're trying to find a woman. Now, before we get into this video, make sure you subscribe to this channel. We're giving you unique insight into the relationship dynamics played out in television and movies that you won't find anywhere else. Our goal is to help you make smart choices when it comes to relationships so that you get better results. Hi, I'm Melanie, and this is Movie Meltdown. Now, let's get into it. We're introduced to Lauren while she's having dinner with her best friend Candace. She's another character from the movie whose relationship we'll explore in a different video. Candace shows Lauren the Think Like a Man book, and Lauren is taken back by it. Off rip, she finds this book to be sexist. Well, at least what she's heard about it because she's never read it. I don't need some bald-headed man on a book telling me that I am strong and independent. She goes on to state that she shouldn't have to lower her standards just for a man, that she just wants to find her equal. And to quote her, an attractive cultured man who is over six feet tall, makes six figures, and isn't intimidated by my success. Candace points out that she's describing her ex-boyfriend, to which Lauren subconsciously agrees with by stating how fine he was. And for reference, this guy is her ex. Yeah, Morris Chestnut. So she wasn't lying, but there's a reason he is her ex, which we will find out why later in the movie. She then makes it known that she is strong and independent as a way to let her friend know that she is who she is and doesn't want to hear any more about what's wrong with her. I just want my equal, okay? Or at least an attractive cultured man who's over six feet tall, makes six figures, and isn't intimidated by my success. Candace tells her that she's just too strong, but Lauren will hear nothing of it and says there's no such thing as being too strong. But in you know what, I gotta be honest, I kind of agree with her, but what she's calling strong is actually being strong-willed, hard-headed, and stubborn. Frustrated by Lauren's lack of self-awareness and reflection, she tells her that she doesn't need a man because she is her own man. Ouch. And they say men don't know how to talk to women. I wonder what the tone police have to say about that. While the two ladies are holding court at dinner, Dominic is in the kitchen thirsting after Lauren. He's a line cook at the restaurant and has a crush on her. She's a frequent patron who spends a lot of money there. We know this because his co-workers point out that she's back, implying that Dominic has been talking to everyone about how much he likes her and wants to be with her. They tell him that she's out of his league because she has a lot of money. And in fact, 
she spends more in one night at the restaurant than his entire paycheck. He plays it off by saying how much money she'll save when he starts to cook for her. But you can kind of see the cracks of his insecurity shine through. I'm not sure how old he's supposed to be in this movie, but I would guess under 25. Or he could be in his 30s and wasted his youth on pipe dreams. You would expect a man in his 30s to be well established in his career and have a purpose in life. But as we'll see, Dominic is a grifter. His main focus are women and playing basketball with his friends. It's like he's stuck in high school. Lauren appears to be in her late 30s to early 40s. Being the COO of a Fortune 500 company requires years of work and tenure. So it's the classic hot for teacher Cougar Town attraction on the surface. But I would go as far to say that it actually mimics a toxic mother and son relationship dynamic. He's clearly not sure of himself, has no career or direction, and instead of working on his purpose, he's obsessed with Lauren. He's unfocused and undisciplined. I would go so far as to call him a modern day Pookie and Ray Ray. While he's opining about Lauren at work, his boss snaps at him because he forgot the scallions on a dish. In fact, it's clear that he is not well respected at his job at all most likely because of the character traits we later see him exhibit in the movie, like being impulsive, risky behavior. Oh, and he's a pathological liar. Actually, come to think of it, I think pathological liar is being generous. This man is a master deceiver with no remorse and no conscience. He's doing such a bad job as a cook, his boss tells him to go park cars at the valet. Now, I don't know how restaurant kitchens work, but I did do a stint as a hostess and a waitress, and I have never seen a cook be demoted to a valet. Like, you have to be pretty terrible at your job to not only be demoted out of the kitchen, but the entire restaurant. I mean, it's given a whole new meaning of being for the streets. We then cut to Lauren getting her car from the valet and Dominic pulls up in a customer's bins. Well, Lauren is like a dog in the heat when she sees this car. Now, I'm not a car person, so I have no idea if it's fancy or not, but Lauren's reaction lets me know that it is pretty significant. They even had sexy music and wind blowing in her hair to show how strong of a reaction she had to this car. It also tells Dominic that this is the key to this woman's heart. Wealth and status are her main drivers in life as we see throughout the movie. She notices the car, then looks at the man driving it. They lock eyes and she gives him this serious flirty look, letting him know that she's attracted to his car. I mean, she's attracted to him, of course. This lights a burning fire in poor Dominic, and he hatches a plan to seduce this woman with money he doesn't actually have. I mean, why work hard to build wealth in a career when you can just fake it, right? Sounds like pretty much all of social media today. Lauren clearly wants this man to chase her down and gives him a strong choosing signal. Dominic, being the beta that he is, of course takes the bait and chases her in the customer's car after she quickly takes off, thus starting the manipulation tactics that she is used to doing to get her way. Rather than staying there and striking up a conversation with the man she's interested in like a normal person, she needs him to chase her because after all, she is the prize. Her ego needs to be stroked and fed like a dog. And what better way than to play games as a 35 plus woman who's strong and independent than to engage in emotional fetch. So Dominic decides to commit a felony and put his job at risk by stealing the customer's car. They meet up at a red light and being the bumbling idiot that this movie portrays men to be, he can't figure out how to open the window but he can drive this complicated car. Okay. Instead, he opens the car door, which is one of those wing type things, which I am sure got Lauren's juices flowing. And if Dominic goes to jail or gets fired, at least he can say it was worth it because he got a date, a possible date 
with his dream girl. I mean, who needs a job when you can live off feelings? Surely that pays the bills somewhere. Besides, I'm sure Lauren will hold him down when he's locked up and down bad. I mean, clearly this woman likes a man for who he is and not what he has. But I guess it was all worth it for him because he does get a date the next day with Lauren. Next, we see her in her very expensive looking condo reading Think Like a Man. You know, the book she said was sexist and that she didn't need because she was strong, independent career woman. But we see that was Cap. Deep down, she knows she has a problem with relationships, but would rather keep a mask of success and not caring than to humble herself by taking advice and changing. While I don't think this book will be of any use to her, I guess it's the thought that counts. Throughout the movie, we see Steve Harvey appear kind of like God as he pours down his wisdom into the soul of woman. I guess this is his way of making a cameo and teaching his principles, which is what he does here while she's reading. Steve comes on screen and says that it is in a man's DNA to be the provider. It makes them feel like a man. And if you won't let us feel like a man, we will find a woman who will. Yikes. This enrages Lauren and offends her very delicate ego. I mean, how dare a man want something that she's not willing to give? You mean men have wants and needs and desires and they're different than women? What? But I give her credit for picking the book back up and attempting to finish it. Meanwhile, we learned that Dominic was fired for stealing the car, as predicted. They don't give us a status, however, on whether he's facing criminal charges. Hmm. But his gang of goofball friends are there to cheer him up and encourage him to keep lying to Lauren. He virtue signals by saying he doesn't want to keep lying to Lauren. But obviously this is a charade just so his friends can keep encouraging him to do this. Like, I don't want to lie anymore. They could tell him that his priorities are off and that he needs to focus on getting his finances and career in order instead of dating. But like the middle schoolers they are, girls are more important than being a functioning adult. They reassure him that lying and deceiving her is okay as long as he knocks it down in the bedroom. Because if he can hook her with sex, then as his friend states, and I quote, once a woman is into you, she will put up with just about anything. Which sounds like the motto for the house of Pookie and Ray Ray, you know, like Game of Thrones, the house of Lannister, house of Stark. I think it would be a great addition to have the house of Pookie and Ray Ray. I can just see the sigil now, three baby mamas in a triangle with a court order for child support in the middle. <laughs> Sounds great. So they go on a date at a fancy restaurant that his friend had to hook him up with because he is broke. This man literally has to borrow, barter, and steal just to impress a woman he barely has ever talked to. But this is what romance looks like in most movies. Men are these bumbling idiots willing to risk life and livelihood in order to get a woman. It's kind of like the princess fantasies from childhood where the man will slay dragons just to throw his coat over a muddy puddle so we don't get our shoes dirty. But here's the catch. Those are childhood fantasies. Men are not going to chase us down, at least not the ones we actually want, just to win us over. Snow White didn't live in the age of the internet, nor Tinder. She was a helpless victim that fled the woods after being abused by her homicidal sociopathic stepmother, who, by the way, is also a evil magical witch. The one man she meets turns out to be a prince with power and money, and very easy on the eyes, and tall, and in shape, and dresses really well. Not only that, he falls in love with her on sight and then kisses her while in a coma. We live in the age of Me Too. He just committed sexual assault on an unconscious victim. If this was today, he would be criminally charged, sued, and then promptly canceled. 
But yet we want to keep believing that someday our prince will come despite knowing how irrational and improbable these narratives are. And if you squint really hard, you can see this Prince Charming narrative being played out with Lauren and Dominic. This man is willing to do just about anything to win her heart, despite her character flaws and there being millions of other women in the world. Somehow she is special and a man is just grateful for the opportunity to be in her presence. It's fortunate for him she wanted him to chase her down in the car, because otherwise we would have to add a stalking charge to him. But back to the date. He lies about being a high profile chef who wants to open his own restaurant. She wants so desperately to be with a successful man that she believes him and in him right away. She likes that he's a dreamer, but in reality, she likes a man with ambition and lots of potential. I mean, she can always build him up to where he needs to be so she can proudly display him to the world and show that she has it all, thus proving all those naysayers wrong like her best friend, Candace. We next see them in her condo post-date coitus. Yes, they slept together on the first date, which I might add is quite ironic because one of the principles in Think Like a Man, the book and the movie, is to make a man wait 90 days before you're intimate with him. This is the storyline of another character in the movie played by Megan Good. So I don't get it. This movie contradicts itself. Now, I know it's a romantic comedy, so I'm not expecting it to be one for one what happens in real life. But come on, why is it okay for Lauren to sleep with Dominic on the first date, but not okay for Megan Good's character to sleep with someone on the first date? And she has to wait 90 days. We'll find out later in the movie if things work out for Lauren versus the other woman, but on its face, it makes no sense. He makes her breakfast in bed, and then we get back to what hobosexuals do best, knocking it down. If this movie was honest, he would stay there while she goes to work and be there when she gets back. He'll keep cooking for her and knocking it down as a form of payment for staying in her place. One day, she'll look up, and he's actually moved in, because this man has no job and no money, and we later find out he barely has a car and definitely doesn't have a place to live. Hence, he is a hobo that uses sex to barter for a place to stay, thus proving my earlier point that he's a hobosexual. We then get another scene of Dominic confiding in his friends about his lies, capping that he doesn't wanna lie anymore, and his friends keep encouraging him to keep up the good work, buddy. Meanwhile, Lauren tells Candace that she really likes that he's a dreamer. She's actually thinking he might be the one. She also states that she no longer cares about a man having money. I mean, is it me or is it just these people lie to themselves in order to justify their moral and character shortcomings? I guess we all do in some way. Now, I could be wrong and maybe she had a change of heart and doesn't care about money anymore. Well, in the next scene, we see Lauren at a company luncheon about to give a speech. And who is there as a catering waiter? None other than Dominic, who had to pick up odd jobs since committing auto theft and getting fired from his job. He drops the tray with dishes on it, classic romantic comedy scene. Lauren sees him and freaks out that he's a waiter. She calls Candace to let her know it's over with him because he's a lowly waiter and he's been lying to her. Her friend reminds Lauren that she doesn't care about a guy making six figures anymore and that she believes in his dreams, to which Lauren replies that he barely makes four figures and that she believes in dreams, just not pipe dreams. So yeah, she still cares very much about status and money. Now, we need to talk about something for a second. Her friend is encouraging her to continue dating a man who has been proven to be a fraud and a pathological liar. This entire friend circle is toxic on both sides and honestly encouraging some of the most trifling behavior. Now, I can't blame Lauren for her reaction to finding out the truth about Dominic. She may be egotistical and delusional, but she seems to be generally honest. You know, the kind that just tells it like it is. You would expect her to be upset to find out the man she's dating is a fraud. I mean, 
I mean, I would be upset too and never speak to this man again. In fact, I would be warning friends and everyone, do not talk to or talk to or date this man. Clearly he is toxic, manipulative, and a user. Any rational and mentally stable woman would see this. But in the next scene, we see Lauren once again on the phone with Candace telling her that Dominic is a loser and that she has to pick him up for their date because his car broke down. That's right, she is still going out with him despite knowing the truth about his lies and him being a fraud. She's choosing to go back to the bad boy hobosexual because she likes drama. He feeds her ego better than any man ever has. Her friend even reminds her of this. She's willing to put up with his foolishness because she loves being the center of his world. And, beca and because she has no better options available right now. This COO who's a prize of mankind and has these high standards that she doesn't need to lower is dating a loser. Well, at least a man she calls a loser. I mean, how many times have we seen this scenario played out in real life? She'll be the same woman who, once she's done being drugged through the mud by Dominic from all his shenanigans, she'll get on social media and say that all men are dogs or where did all the good men go? And I'm just like, gee, golly, gosh, maybe they were watching all the toxic drama you were going through and have decided to avoid your behind. She arrives to his apartment, and by his apartment, I mean his friend's apartment that he's pretending is his and is ready to give him a piece of her mind. But when she sees how grand this place is, she quickly changes her tune. Yes, this man is still lying to her and deceiving her by pretending that this is his apartment. And even though Lauren knows that he's just a waiter because he confessed in the movie everything to her, she chooses to believe him again. This apartment is a two-story loft with private roof access and a valet in LA. Any rational person would know that an unemployed line chef valet waiter criminal could not afford this place. Rather than investigate and ask questions, she gives in to him once again because he's cooked for her, has a nice apartment and fancy wine. Of course, they sleep together again and we're graced with a montage of them rolling around in rose petals, naked and laughing. I think this is the movie's attempt to show us how they have a real connection and romance. That because this man is focusing solely on pleasing her and winning her over, that she is somehow lucky. That if she would just let go of her list of demands in a man and settle with this hobo, that she would live in a happily ever after bliss. When in real life, there's nothing to admire in either one of these characters. Their romance is built on lies and they're unequally yoked. In real life, there'd be a lot of drama, heartache, and problems. The next morning, they're leaving his friend's fake apartment and the valet pulls up Dominic's hoopty. This car is not being maintained whatsoever. The front bumper is completely gone and it looks a bit rusted through. And remember, it had broken down the night before, but, but somehow magically now it can be driven, okay? Once again, showing us that this man does not have his priority straight. He should not be dating when he can't afford a place to stay, keep employment, or even take care of his car. Lauren is obviously embarrassed and ashamed of this when she sees it. But as the old saying goes, there's a ram in the bush. Because at this exact moment when Dominic is leaving, guess who pulls up? That good old ex, Morris Chestnut. Mm -mm -mm. Lauren gets all giddy and starts flirting with him. She finds out that he's getting a divorce and moving to LA. He's also looking at apartments in this building since he just landed a job as CEO of a Fortune 500 company. But this goes back to my earlier point, that this apartment that she's so impressed with, that Dominic had, is not even in the same tax bracket of 99.99% of people. This man who has this hoopty car that he can't keep up with is just a part-time waiter 
somehow can afford this penthouse apartment that even CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are shopping for real estate in. This COO couldn't do basic critical thinking because if she had, she would have known that he was lying again. But the reality is she doesn't care that he is a liar. She is fine with it as long as he doesn't lie to her about having money and status. Those need to be real, which speaks to her morals and priorities. <sighs> well, anyway, she sets up a date with her ex. Well, I guess a get together, you know, let's catch up. It's hypergamy 101. The next scene, Lauren and Dominic are meeting for lunch. And Dominic is doing his usual simping by telling her all this romantic stuff. But Lauren cuts him off. Just like in a business deal, she needs to cut to the chase. She wants to fire him, and she has a severance package that she needs to present. She asked her investor friends to take a look at a restaurant prospectus that she put together for him, and that they are very interested. Because remember, she needs a man who is very, very, very successful or has the potential to be. She actually puts this together without him. I'm assuming when she was still in the I believe in his dreams phase, she was going to push him to success despite himself. But now it's the discard phase, which is typical of a narcissist when they're done with you. What's even crazier is she knows Dominic is a liar and a fraud, yet she is willing to let her friends invest in a business with him. He has no real drive or competence, but somehow she thinks it's a good idea for her friends to invest with this guy. This shows you how toxic she really is. She is willing to throw them under the bus because it helps her to get rid of Dominic. Whatever consequences they face, she can wash her hands of any responsibility or pretend like she didn't know that he was a giant fraud. His worshiping of her is not enough anymore to put up with his antics because now she has an option. The option, in fact. You know, the one that got away. Now, she does love the attention from Dominic, but her ex has real money and power, and this is just too intoxicating for her not to pursue. She breaks up with him and even tells him that she's going back with her ex. And she just assumes that her ex will want her too. Just because he agreed to get together to catch up doesn't mean that y'all are going to be together or that he wants you. But typical Lauren, what Lauren wants, she will make sure she gets. We see this again later in the movie. She just assumes she can have any man she wants, although there is zero evidence of this being the reality of her life. Poor Dominic, he is like a wounded puppy and starts begging for her to stay with him. And when he sees it's not working, he throws a tantrum and says she's treating this like a business transaction. He's about to storm off and cry, but before he does, he turns around and what do you think he does? You know, tells her off, cusses her out, gives her the middle finger. No, he kisses her on the top of her head. Then he storms off on me and angry. It honestly looks like his mom is putting him on punishment for getting bad grades, but he still wants to please her, you know, so he can drive the car on the weekend. I can't help but to think of this scene from Friday when that guy got his chain snatched by Debra and then he takes off crying, oh, my chain. <laughs> That's Dominic. She just sits there, stone-faced and unfazed. Well, we can see she's a little stunned that he just didn't take her dismissal of services better because she didn't really have feelings for him. She can't empathize with what he's going through. For her, life is a series of transactions, and each success of one should lead her to greater accomplishments and wealth. She's learned to suppress emotions and is like a stone wall. Dominic is a man who has no control over his emotions. In fact, he's led by them. This is why he has no direction in life and is chaotic. Honestly, I think she's just disgusted by his lack of self-control. And clearly, she is the alpha dominant in this relationship, and he is a beta. Finally, we get to the end. 
Lauren has been dating her ex for some months and is on FaceTime with Candace discussing how hard it is for a CEO and a COO to coordinate their schedules. I mean, she's just got to remind everybody how important they both are. She's excited that they finally are able to see each other and have dinner that night. Candace lets her know that everyone is going to the opening of Dominic's food truck. Lauren is surprised by this, and this lets us know that she has not been thinking about this man, talking about him, asking questions, because their friend groups, are, they run in the same circles. So she really could care less about Dominic and what he's doing. But now hearing about him having a business, she's intrigued. She sees the potential this could have. A food truck today, a hundred franchises tomorrow. While at dinner with her new but old flame, she's distracted. You can literally see the calculation on her face as she decides which man she would rather be with. Morris Chestnut is going on and on about himself and she sarcastically interrupts him by letting him know he doesn't let her talk nor does he care about what she has going on. She misses being the center of gravity in Dominic's world and now that he has this new business, my girl's got options. Let's not forget that this man is irrational, lazy, a fraud, a liar, and led by his emotions. This behavior does not exist in a vacuum. It's not like over here in relationships, he's, he's this way, but in business, he's this competent, upstanding businessman. This man couldn't hold down a job before due to his incompetence and his criminal behavior, but now we are to believe that he magically is this boss dude, business owner, after a few short months. I give this food truck about six months before he defaults on the loan or gets shut down by the health department for cutting corners. Now back to Morris, a high value man who is a CEO and has too much going on right now to make her a top priority in his life. She does not like this, but she knew this is how he was. Hence the reason why they are probably exes. It's said that when looking back at relationships, we tend to see the good more than the bad when our present circumstances are not what we want them to be. We minimize why we broke up in the first place and focus on the good times. Maybe she thought he changed. Maybe she deluded herself into believing that she had grown and changed when most likely she just added to her list of standards that a man needed to meet as she climbed the corporate ladder and got older. But clearly this didn't work because she was dating what she called a loser hobo and she came running back to her ex the moment he breathed in her direction. If these standards really brought about all these options and, these, and she was such a prize, why is she <laughs> balancing between these two men? I mean, you would think having all these standards would yield better results, but no, because wherever you are, there you will be. She is still the same egotistical person she has always been. She cannot play second fiddle or imagine a man that has more to focus on than her. So she decides to go get Dominic back. It doesn't even occur to her that maybe Dominic wouldn't want her anymore. She's just used to getting what she wants, even if what she wants is a whole nother person. They couldn't possibly have free will. I want you. We know this because she runs up to his food truck and just assumes a few sweet words would be enough to get him back. But he's strong now. And he refuses her. Being the spoiled, demanding brat that she is, she gets in his truck while there's a line of customers, then proceeds to cuss out and tell off a customer, and forces Dominic to listen to her. She must get him back, and she will not take no for an answer. Dominic, you know, he resists at first, and is, you know, he's playing the fake macho that he's, you know, I guess he's imagined himself to be because he has a food truck now but he keeps listening to her and eventually gives in. And I guess they lived happily ever after. The end. Aww. Now, I know this is a romantic comedy. It's not supposed to be, you know, serious. It's not supposed to be exactly like real life. But 
This movie is different because it is based off of a self-help dating book. So the principles that are in it are supposed to be working in real life for us. I will be curious to find out how many marriages and long-term relationships have been created by following the vice, think like a man. Which leads me to my next point, which are the takeaways. What can we learn from this dynamic that we can apply into our own lives? Number one, stop listening to friends when you should be listening to a therapist. Friends are great for support and helping us talk through our issues, but they are oftentimes just as broken as we are. Well-meaning advice could lead us into very toxic situations. This is why therapy is so important. Having a professional to help us navigate through our emotions and trauma will enable us to be the healthiest we can be mentally and emotionally. The healthier we are, the better we can spot red flags, which leads to my next point. Stop ignoring red flags. Once a person shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Sure, people can grow and change, but oftentimes we put on rose-colored glasses and want to believe in a person we're emotionally tied to. Choosing to overlook when a person crosses our boundaries or forgiving them when there's really no change will just delay the inevitable and make the heartache that much worse once the relationship falls apart. We can also get into dangerous situations with people who are not mentally stable or good for us. And finally, focus on core values, not feelings. Now, I'm not saying feelings don't matter. You should have feelings for your romantic partner. However, feelings and emotions come and go. They can cause a person to do irrational things like pick a person that makes them feel good but are not good for them. You need to identify your long-term goals, your weaknesses, your strengths, and your boundaries before you enter a relationship. The more clarity you have about these things, the better you will be able to pick a spouse who will balance you out and vice versa. Well, that's it for this video. You guys let me know in the comments what you think about this. And also, let me know what movie you would like me to analyze next. Now, I will be breaking down the other three couples, primary couples in this movie, um, in some videos to come. And yeah, so I'll see you guys in the next one.